You know something that's really funny the more you think about it? Every Nintendo Direct, every Pokemon Day, every other day of the week, Pokemon fans all over the world are clamoring for that sweet and zesty remake of Pokemon White and Pokemon Black. All of us Pokemon fans love the idea of seeing Castelia City expanded into this giant metropolis. The grandiose, dramatic Elite Four would be a spectacle to behold, and my god, Driftvale City's theme would go so fucking hard. But what's funny about it is it's pretty much universally agreed that the last two gens remakes kind of missed the mark. The discussion around them when the games actually come out is of their shortcomings and issues. So it is kind of odd that we're sitting here hungering for a Unova region on the Nintendo Switch or Nintendo Switch 2. Because in actuality, a copy-paste into a slicker looking engine is not going to create a masterpiece. We know this by now. It could still very likely be plagued with what makes the last gen remakes dull, lazy, uninspired, nostalgia bait. But in the time between the wrapping up of Gen 9 and its DLCs, and the next Legends entry in Legends ZA, great name, my mind can't help but wonder where the Gen 5 remakes are and if I even want them. Which makes me so sad to think about, because of course I should want it. A gorgeous upgrade of one of the best generations packed with new and exciting content that has developed throughout the years since the original's release. But it's also not a bold take to say the growing laziness and lack of care towards these remakes has made the last two specifically less than stellar. So I ripped another adventure back into these remade regions, and while a few things do elevate them above the originals, a whole lot brings them down, and they really miss the point of a Pokemon remake. A Pokemon remake should do two things. Firstly, it should use the updated graphical capabilities to freshen up the region and the lore that we've already experienced before. And secondly, deliver content for the game that the original was simply unable to deliver when it came out, done in engaging and immersive ways, not just a lazily slapped together quantity over quality experience. If you're not gonna give us a new region, then at the very least, one we've already been to should still succeed at both taking us back in time to those aged wonderlands, and have a fresh creative identity to warrant a return and make it feel worth it. These points are what make the Heart Gold and Soul Silver remakes stand out so strong. The updated graphics that were available on the DS complement the fuck out of the Johto region. This simple addition of the artwork on these buildings and rooftops in Ecritique City make the city feel so wholly unique, all paired with the slight lighting differences from the sun, giving that feeling that dusk is setting on the city at all times. I want to live here so badly, it is just like, it is the ultimate vibe city. Olivine City's lighthouse looks a, a bit better by comparison, and just naturally feels more exciting to be in and travel up and see the reveal of the Ampharos at the top being the light. Even Elix Forest, probably the blandest forest the series has ever had, has this nice spice of life brought to it in the remake. The lighting from the sun and moon depending on the time of day pierce through giving us these sporadic spots of illumination. It is so apparent these games specifically were made as a love letter to this region, and I think that's why people hold them in such high regard. But that's kind of where the Gen 3 remakes fall short a, a lot. We have some highlights and some mixed bags and, and a lot of duds. Marvel City specifically is such a frustrating example of what to do and also what not to do. This revamp really adds some spices of life to the world. The whole mall complex vibe of it is almost flexing all the cool shit they are able to have because they're connected to the powerful generator just below the city. Becoming this energy powerhouse city perfectly topped off with the fact that the leader is an electric gym leader. Going that extra step to really make it feel like he's a part of that city. They take the time and effort to make it look more fleshed out for the Hoenn's entire lore, so why couldn't they have taken the time to make it feel more fleshed out, man? Yes, being able to look at a city and get a vibe from it is great, especially in Pokemon. But Fortree City did that in the original. Slateport did that in the original. And don't even get me started on fucking Laveridge Town. So while I love that Mobville joined that aesthetically pleasing group of cities with a nice specific aesthetic to it, the contents within the actual city damn near counteract everything that the new look brought because they for some reason decided to turn it into a generic shit hub zone. And I don't like shit hub zones, I like cool hub zones with 
girls that'll talk to me and fucking Marvin, man. It has a food court where you can battle five trainers gauntlet style. Not to be confused with the house that's ten feet above Mauville where you battle the Winstraight family and get this really fun world building interaction. Where they talk about how their son is on his way to battle the Elite Four and become champion of the Hoenn region. Further building this world is actually lived in with real people who share your goals. Then there's move tutors. Shops that just give you customizations that could have easily just been put into a department store style building. Imagine some bright ass environment killing department store acting as the heart of Mauville City. Give some of the citizens a bit of dialogue about how cool the department store is, almost giving them the vibe that they're a little elitist with how fucking cool they are. Then you can add some dialogue to the breeder in the daycare that's just outside of Mauville and she can be noticeably appreciative about how you're choosing to come let them level up in a daycare instead of just pumping them full of vitamins. So many little things that could be done to further immerse this exciting world. It just isn't done because they have the logic of bigger equals better. And Mauville is really big now, so that's cool. Shout out to the TV Mauville building that specifically has nothing of interest in it. But thank god we got not only the bike shop, but some bike racks. <laughs> This is what I mean when I say a remake should strengthen not only the look, but the lore of a world. A fresh coat of paint doesn't equal more exciting to be in. What's great about Laveridge Town in the original isn't just how aesthetically cool some fucking hot springs are. It's that we get to trek down this ash-covered mountain to get to it. The fact that Flannery has found her home here and has decided to embrace it and become the fire type gym leader. But now we have to talk about Chibi Diamond and Chibi Pearl. Wow, did they miss the mark with these bad boys. The chibi art style is by no means ugly. I would never sit here and shit on the people who probably spent an insane amount of time chibifying the shit out of these models. They are cute and they are playful and that's great. The reason that this art style doesn't work in the Sinnoh region comes from, firstly, its inconsistency. I understand that the chibi art style would not look good in battle. Reading the text, you are now challenged by Team Galactic leading, distortion world creating, mewing god Cyrus, and then seeing this character model, then the most cute ass Gyarados or Honch Crow or whatever pops out of a Pokeball looking all cute. It just really doesn't fit the tone of the fight, does it? Which is why I don't think the chibi art style is an issue because it's bad, and I don't even think the chibi art style is bad for Pokemon. It just doesn't fit the Sinnoh region and the stories being told in Diamond and Pearl. These games were the first gens to really full send the whole being the person responsible for permanently saving and changing the world narratives. The lore of these games legendary Pokemon are that they are in control of time, space, and a place called the Distortion World. If you are reading the lore of Pokemon and read the line, Gerantinus sought revenge against Arceus and opened space-time rifts on top of Mount Coronet, what in God's name sends the signal to someone's brain of, let's see that in the cutest art style around. And the art design and map layout of the original Diamond and Pearl games is probably the best in the entire series in terms of escalation of the grand adventure. You start the game right next to one of the three lakes and you immediately hear about the mythical Pokemon that live around it. So seeing the other two on the map acts as this immediate incentive to want to go and explore the entire region. It starts out with these small caverns connecting a mining city into the beautiful Floroma town. Then shit gets a little more daunting with the marshy raining tall grass section. Some rougher terrain to have to traverse and it starts to really wear your Pokemon down, especially when they always miss in the fucking fog. That's cool. Then sending you on a treacherous climb up a mountain to reach Snow Point City, which in turn gets you to one of the lakes. The layout of this map provides the player with a subconscious escalation intention. One with a story peaking on the very top of the mountain in the center of the map, a place called the Spear Pillar. At the time of their release, Diamond and Pearl were the first Pokemon games to fully embrace a hero's journey outside of just becoming the best trainer, like no one ever was. Just look how cool scaling the giant waterfall is to the toughest gauntlet of battle you've ever fought. Inside the castle is a Garchomp that can one-tap your entire team, so it's just weird when it's led by this adorable chibi girl. 
And then you enter the battle and whoop, tonal whiplash, now she's hot and she has a cool outfit and she has a normal sized head that fits her body, I, I guess this is epic now. It had a story that revolved around the zero to hero mindset and chibi art style will just never be able to capture that in an equally immersive way. Now at the end of the day, art style and graphics are important, but what's more important is what actually awaits us in the game itself. While the sick new paint job of these beautiful, lore-rich worlds is important for the immersion, the main selling point of a Pokemon remake should be all the ways Game Freak can expand upon it while sticking true to the original experience. Filling the game with exciting content that refreshes the game better than any graphics update ever could. Fire Red and Leaf Green introduced these Sevi Islands to Gen 1, and while they're a bit of fun late game tomfoolery, it still would have been nice to get maybe some Gym or Elite 4 rematches. Maybe the battle tower just for that little extra spice. While it's a lot easier to give the game a bit of a pass because it was released before even Pokemon Emerald, which is crazy to think about, there still wasn't a lot of Pokemon gaming out in the world at that time, truthfully. But just that little touch of something extra could have gone a long way. It's where I do have to give a bit of props to the Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu remakes for the Nintendo Switch. While I'm personally not a huge fan of the catch-only aspect of Wild Encounters, especially when it requires a separate encounter screen for something like the seamless loop that Legends Arceus has, I do have to raise a glass to it. Not just for making the Kanto region look fucking charming and tonally consistent, but also changing up the gameplay a bit to deliver something different to Gen 1. Even if it isn't the perfect bullseye that a Pokemon game can be. I'd rather experience change and learn what I like and don't like. However, Heart Gold and Soul Silver once again prove that they are the fucking goats of the remakes. You want to talk about filling a game with as much shit as possible? Not only does it follow what the originals did, including the entire Kanto region afterwards, and a true boss battle of Red on top of Mount Silver. But then they took the battle frontier, which was pretty much all of Emerald's post-game content, and tossed that shit in too. Then we got gym matches, Elite Four rematches, trainer matches for every day of the week. A Pokewalker, which is kind of fucking stupid, but also kind of neat. Whatever the fuck is going on at the Triathlon Dimodome place. Buddy Pokemon to help make the entire journey feel more personal. And fucking Apricorns. This entire game is drenched in an atmosphere of adventure that you cannot just bat out real quick. You have to grind if you want to truly master everything that this game has to offer. And like I just mentioned with some more grounded things to make it feel more intimate like the buddy Pokemon or the random photo ops to capture your adventure at any time. It is just the amalgamation of every well crafted piece of every previous game. Something that really was the peak for remaking the games. But unfortunately HeartGold and SoulSilver do plant the seeds for what would later become the worst content dumps to ever plague the remakes and all Pokemon games in general. That being the extreme oversaturation of legendaries. One of the most exciting aspects of a remake is getting to experience the higher visual quality stories and quests that lead us to the game's legendary Pokemon. Finally getting that 3D model of Kyogre, knowing that there will be some way to also get that sweet sweet 3D model of Rayquaza. Seeing the arrival of Ho-Oh on top of the bell tower, the emergence of the fucking Time Ruler Dialga, this is all what makes Pokemon so satisfying to play. The build up to the story's climax that always results in you getting some grand legendary always makes the journeys feel so worth it. These remakes have done great things with their legendaries, don't get me wrong. I love that in the Gen 3 remakes we get this epilogue that has us battling Xenia, then chasing meteorite shards and scaling the sky pillar, all culminating in this great moment where Rayquaza rejects Xenia as its protector, ending in us getting to duke it out with him and catch him. It's the type of storytelling that makes the game's main story so great. Made even better when you realize there's a little more to it even, and you get to go to space and fight Deoxys, who's just the GOAT. The remakes have mostly nailed making the legendaries feel like big deals through their stories, but the same cannot be said about all the random static and roaming legendaries. I will forever be a proponent of making the legendaries feel special. 
I understand that with Pokemon Go and Pokemon Home, you can just have like 17 copies of one legendary or mythical Pokemon, most of which are probably shiny, but nothing will take you out of the magic of one of these regions, like being able to just go around and catch a fuck ton of legendary Pokemon. The National Dex expanding is an exciting addition to every remake because we get to experience new mons in a region we were once so familiar with. It's a great shakeup and adds that nice layer of desire to catch them all and battle with them all. But holy fuck this world feels so ridiculous and nonsensical when you can just go through and get a grocery shopping list of legendaries. All of which are supposed to be these legendary beasts from their respective region. The triumphs of the game should be about the ragtag team you pile together and train alongside with. It's where the addictive immersion lies at the heart of all of these games. So sure, the journey in the moment does have that satisfaction, but at the same time, it also doesn't feel very good to look back on that journey and realize that your entire party the whole way just kinda sucked because you're now in possession of these giant legendary beasts that just objectively have like the best stats in the game. Legendaries are like the perfect example of what I was getting at when I said the new content being put into these games should build upon the world in immersion, not just be a lazy quantity over quality con. The best thing these remakes could have done was not make it so the vast expanse of new Pokemon doesn't open up until you've already beaten the game. I'm not saying when Lucas teaches you how to catch a Pokemon he has to say, let me use this Dragapult as a fucking example, no. But they could have put the slightest amount of thought and creativity creativity and rebuilding these regions, just to add some nice flourishes of excitement and uniqueness. In BDSP, just outside of Jubilife City, there's a youngster trainer who you can actually battle with. And he says that there's a Pokemon that doesn't actually come out during the day in the patch of grass he's by. So he's gonna sit there and just fucking edge himself until nighttime when that Pokemon comes out and he can battle it or catch it. At the time of playing the remakes, I couldn't remember if this fellow was in the originals or not. So for a little bit, I got really excited and had a little too much faith in Game Freak as a company. I thought that maybe if I also came back at night, and by that I mean manipulate the time of Switch like it's Animal Crossing, that there would be encounters in this game that I couldn't even get in the original. Maybe a Poochiana or a Gossifleur to help the player out with Rourke by giving them that extra grass super effective damage. Just something little to show the player that this world will expand beyond the Sinnoh region that we're used to without completely ripping us out of the game with abrupt Pokemon placement choices. Which, call me crazy, but seems like the exact fucking thing a Pokemon remake should be trying to do. The remakes of Pokemon's generations have so much potential. A chance to fulfill the creative endeavors of entries that are console generations old. Yet, in typical modern Game Freak fashion, they end up feeling like nothing more than the ever-growing money generator that they have turned Pokemon into. But there is a glimmer of hope for remakes, and that is with the Legends Arceus game. Legends Arceus feels a bit more like an honest attempt to reinvent Pokemon in its own unique series' way. It feels like there's some creative decisions being made with that game, and that's nice to see in Pokemon. Hopefully ZA will also be like that. But I think Legends Arceus being well received, specifically being praised for a breath of fresh air, hopefully Game Freak will take that as a wink wink nudge nudge that they can branch out and get a little zesty with their games, even their remakes. I love the idea of a Univer region with an even more expanded Pokedex, including touches of everything right up to the Paldia region. All sprinkled throughout the game that just make the region feel more fleshed out and more alive than ever. Putting those little tweaks on the story to really max out the excitement, fixing up the checklist or cat and mouse parts of it, all in service of creating an unforgettable Pokemon remake. Does the existence of Legends Arceus guarantee that's gonna happen? Of course not. But I think its existence does show we might get some creative decisions that put us a bit more on the spectrum towards Heart Gold and Fire Red remakes than the most current ones. This day and age of remakes and remasters is very strange. Because we have some games that really needed it, and the company remaking it completely delivered in reinventing a new game essentially for a new audience of gamers. And that's just fucking great. Then there's some games that do benefit from having a remake or a remaster as a visual overhaul, but because of the way the games are crafted, you simply can't really add contents to the game or expand on the original game's mechanics or anything. Then of course, there's a very large pile of games getting remade that haven't even aged to the point they need one, and it really just feels like a scam. 
Shazam. And then there's Pokemon, somehow in its own unique category. A gen's mechanics could be overhauled into a completely refreshing playstyle that reinvents Pokemon in general, but that's sort of what Legends Arceus did, and from the looks of it, what ZA is going to continue to do. And while Gen 5 through 7 are on the limited capabilities of a handhold console, they by no means look bad. And their art style still holds up even going all the way back to the first fucking generation. So while I would personally rather a Gen 5 or on remake embrace the differences of the Legends game, or even try and change it up like the Let's Go games did just better, I also can't be upset about them just giving us a solid looking remake that adds new content to the game, and makes the region feel more unique and special to have an adventure in, or having stuff added to it. We just need to get out of this sad cycle of cash grab remakes that totally eliminate the unique identity of every region, adding nothing new and completely missing the point of what a Pokemon remake should be. I love Pokemon a lot. It was the first game my four-year-old self got his little gamer hands on 20 years ago. I'm gonna die one day. But throughout mine and a lot of people's lives, Pokemon has been that one constant escape that they get to look forward to. I will always be drawn towards art that is about adventure. From an epic saga to a more personal hero's journey. An adventure filmed with whimsy and charm. Threats that will make us feel like we will never get over them. Rewarding victories and heartbreaking sacrifices. All of the things that make a journey and an adventure into an unknown world great. That's why even throughout all the awful decisions these games make, I will always truly believe that Pokemon is capable of being one of the greatest game series to ever exist. And I'm pretty sure if you're watching this, you believe that as well. But all we can do is hope that one day we get to that utopia of quality after quality Pokemon games. Thank you for watching this video about Pokemon.